What do you want? Hopefully you have some idea how not to answer Mr. Morden's question, and we'll have a look at the last of Thomas's possibilities on this episode of The Sci-Fi Show. <laughs> Mr. Morden would like to know what we want, and we've been looking at some of the possibilities with the help of medieval philosopher Thomas Aquinas. So far, we've looked at a collection of different material possibilities. Wealth, honour, fame, power, any bodily good. And each time we've come up short. All of these will end up being means to getting what we want, and not really what we actually want. So this leaves us with soulish goods instead of material ones to consider. As I said, in the last episode, if you don't like the term soul, then you can substitute a word like mind instead. Although I don't like the word mindish, so I'll stick with soulish. The first of the soulish goods to consider is a familiar one, pleasure. If you remember back to the episode on utilitarianism, this is the measure of the good that they want to use. So can pleasure provide us with what we seek? It would seem that it's a likely candidate. You don't seek pleasure as a means to some other end, it's an end in itself. Doesn't make sense to ask, what do you seek pleasure for? Pleasure is the reward. Thomas also observes that desire is good, and so if everybody desires something, that must be the best thing, and everybody desires delight. Both the wise and the foolish. Therefore happiness consists in pleasure. Never let it be said that Thomas doesn't tackle the best objections to his position. So why does pleasure fall short? If it was the end, we wouldn't have a few more to do. So why doesn't Thomas think this works? He first cites the philosopher Boethius, who says, Anyone that looks back on his past excesses will perceive that pleasures had a sad ending. And if they can render a man happy, there's no reason why we should not say that the very beasts are happy too. And perhaps we would say that. Although it's worth remembering that Thomas when he speaks of happiness, is speaking of a fulfilled and worthwhile life, not just a transitory emotional state. So pigs rolling in the mud can enjoy themselves, they certainly seem to, but they can't be happy in the appropriate sense. But why does Thomas think that happiness cannot consist in pleasure, even when we look at it in the right sense? It isn't because pleasure isn't good, it is. And it isn't because pleasure is a means to something else. Actually, it's the reverse of that. Pleasure is a reward for obtaining the good. It's like honour in the re that regard, but more intimate. Pleasure can't be the goal because pleasure is the reward for achieving the goal. It's an accident of the good, not its essence, and we are seeking its essence. This idea explains one of the strange paradoxes of pleasure seeking. If you chase a pleasurable experience because it's a pleasurable experience, you'll find yourself always chasing it and never finding it. Trying to make pleasure the end fails for the same reason all the other sources of happiness do. It isn't the source of happiness, but a means toward it or a result from it. You can't substitute a product for its source, it seems. Perhaps our next attempt will fare better. Thomas asks if some good of the soul can constitute man's happiness. I'm not sure Mr. Morden could provide these, but we should consider the possibility anyway. Perhaps we'll need to conclude Morden can't really offer us anything of value at all. Thomas's first line of thought about why some good of the soul might suffice is because he's already eliminated all the other candidates. Material and bodily goods won't suffice, so what are we left with? Thomas's other objection revolves around this same theme. We know what a person's happiness cannot consist in. Having eliminated all the other possibilities, this is what we're left with. Happiness is a perfection of man, but it isn't a bodily perfection, so it must be a soulish perfection. Unsurprisingly, at this point, Thomas disagrees. Though, it does get a little complicated. Given even philosophers as great as Aristotle and Plato didn't make it past this one, it's probably reasonable to expect it to be difficult, but let's press on. Thomas says that a good of the soul can't be man's happiness, his final end, because it is a participated and not a universal good. This means that they can only have goods in some finite amount. The good is apportioned them. But the true good that which will make us happy in the right sense, cannot be something limited in such a manner. The soul is limited in such a manner, so it cannot be the source we are looking for. 
This isn't to say that happiness isn't a good of the soul, just that it isn't that source of final happiness we seek. A perfected soul, a good soul, will be happy, but that happiness will not be contained within it. So this brings us to Thomas's final possibility. Can happiness be found in any created good at all? You can probably guess the answer at this point, but let's flesh it out. The final objection here is a little esoteric. The first one involves man reaching out to a higher created being, an angel, which in light of the Babylon 5 universe would suggest that the Vorlons are our highest good, which they might like. His second objection points to a man as a part of the whole universe and the universe, the whole of creation, as the highest good. And finally, that man's satisfaction is found in that which he can desire, but man cannot desire any uncreated goods, so there must be one that satisfies. Now Thomas concludes with the idea that no created goods can be man's happiness because true happiness will satisfy forever and satisfy completely. When we find the source of happiness, we will be completely satiated by it, but there's nothing created that can fit that bill because they're all finite. The only thing that can satisfy in the required way must be the universal good, and that, according to Thomas, is God. This shouldn't be completely surprising. Thomas was a medieval scholastic philosopher and a Christian monk. Thomas agreed with his forebear, Augustine of Hippo, that our hearts are restless until they rest in you. This brings up an interesting anecdote in the life of Thomas. Near the end of his life, his life's master work, the 4,000 or so pages of the Summa Theologicae, is an unfinished work that he stopped writing just before he died. Thomas had a vision of God towards the end of his life and it put the Summa in a new perspective for him. He regarded this amazing work of wisdom as mere straw. And to put that in perspective, straw was what was used to contain animal dung. So Thomas is saying he regards his master's life work as toilet paper. So where does this leave us? Is Thomas right? Can Mr. Morden really offer us nothing at all that will make us truly happy? Will we search in vain for some created good to make us happy because the source of happiness is the same as the source of all created goods? This suggests something of a conundrum. I think Thomas is right that the source of our happiness cannot be found in this life, that his argument against any created good being able to satisfy is sound. But what if you deny that such a thing exists? What if there are no non-created goods? Where would that leave us? Just as the butt of a gigantic cosmic practical joke? forever cast adrift in the void to search and long after a happiness that can never be obtained? The 20th century atheist philosopher Albert Camus ran up against this problem and struggles with the problem in his novel The Plague. In it, the hero, Dr. Bernard Rue, knows three things for certain. That the purpose of life is to be a saint, that to be a saint requires God, and that God doesn't exist. What do you do in such a circumstance? What's the way out? If true happiness involves becoming a saint and not some unrelated good, and no such thing exists because you require God to become a saint in the required fashion, there seems to be no solution. Existence is absurd. I'm not sure how to resolve it without denying the third premise and admitting the existence of God. I hope you found this exploration of Mr. Morden's question interesting, and it's giving you some food for thought to puzzle over whether or not Thomas was right, whether or not Mr. Morden could provide you with something you really want. This leads into the next episode, where we explore the other great question in Babylon 5, Who are you? That the Vorlons and their emissaries ask over and over, and dives into the realm of philosophical anthropology. Until then, you can find more information on the different ideas contained in this episode in the show notes, on scifishow.com, and if you missed Babylon 5 when it aired, you can find links to purchase it from Amazon in the show notes. I can be reached with comments via feedback at scifishow.com, you can leave a comment in the show notes at sci show.com and you can also leave them on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash sci-fi show. You can also follow the show via The Sci-Fi Show on Twitter. If you do enjoy the show, please go over to our Facebook page and click like. If there's a topic you would like me to look into, please don't hesitate to ask. And don't forget, it's fire with a PH. Let me know what you think. The Sci-Fi Show is recorded under a Creative Commons Attribution and Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license, and the music is provided by Furious J and Maniacal M.
The Sci-Fi Show is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, interface Christianity with the world, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.